And welcome to the Blue Line here on WHBL. Mike Tress and Andrew Callista alongside you. And on Super Bowl weekend, Penn State hit the road for some conference ice hockey play against Ohio State. Penn State still trying to get that first win in Big Ten play, which has been a struggle all season. Yeah, Penn State coming in 0-6-0 in Big Ten play, but a lot of people thought this was a series Penn State could get their first W. They just need to overcome some of the little mistakes like they had against teams like Boston College to finally get that elusive first Big Ten win. And against the Eagles in the last game before this one, they actually played one of their best games of the season. And they were, did a great job against Boston College in shutting down the scores. Hopefully, that would be something they could do against Ohio State. But in the Ohio State game, it was all about goalie Christian Fry and the Buckeyes scoring. First period, Justin De Silva fires, stopped by Amy McAdam. The rebound to Tanner Fritz finds Max McCormick for his eighth of the season in a 1 0 lead. Rebounds would be a theme. Same score next period, Matt Johnson. It's shot over by Chad Nittery and Johnson. Great hustle around. He ends up scoring 2 0 game under 30 seconds later on the power play. Ryan Dezingle fires his shot by a diving. McCormick is punched in for a 3 0 belly flop score. Comfortable lead, but they're not done. Same period. Penn State's on the power play, and Ricky DeRosa's pass picked by Nick Odo gives it to Dezingle. Easy score there in front of McAdam for his 15th of the year. 4 0 lead. McAdam doing his best in the third to stop the onslaught by Ohio State. 27 saves in the game, and Penn State finally answers on their own power play. Zach Saar's shot deflected out to David Goodwin. He gets the goal to go, fifth of the year, splitting all five Buckeyes, but in the end, too late. Zingle added an empty netter, and Christian Fry made 46 saves in the 5-1 Buckeye blowout. Game one, obviously a letdown for the Lions. They were playing good hockey coming into this one, but they had less than 18 hours to bounce back before they took the ice Saturday afternoon. Coach Godowski looking for that first Big Ten win. Would it come? Good start for the Lions in this one. Only 2.30 in off a turnover. Connor Varley with a great look to Dylan Richard. Snaps it high and upstairs. Lions lead 1-0. First lead since September 28th against Boston College. Four minutes later, Jacob Friedman flips it on net and gets a good bounce out to Casey Bailey, and he risks one high. This time, stick side past Christian Fry. Lions feeling good, up to nothing. Is this the time to get their first Big Ten win? Looking to go up 3-0 at the end of the first. Lions aggressive and attacking the net. You saw Eric Stride with a couple good opportunities right there, but it would be two zip going into the second, and points leader Ryan to single on the break, but Scoffer stones him. Take another look. The Zingle fakes backhand, goes forehand. Scoffer with the great poke check. Bucks on the power play now. Great passing here. De Zingle, Shilke to Tanner Fritz. Beats Scoff with the toe drag. Two to one. Best power play clicking. Don't put him back on the power play. But Eric Scheid does it with the hook. And guess who makes him pay? It's the Zingle with his 17th of the year on this blast from the point around the screen. Scoff never saw it. Matt trying to stop the bleeding as he stones Max McCormick in front. And we go to four on four hockey now. Two on one for the Lions and it's Loic to Richard who can't finish, but a penalty's called. Lions going on to four on three power play, but don't capitalize. Still two all to Zingle, to Odo, who finds Greco. Again, great Buckeye passing. Three, two bucks and Max McCormick, the dagger from the blue line, beats Scoff, never saw the puck. The Buckeyes would add an empty netter, and Penn State falls to Ohio State 5-2. And here's a recap from Columbus. A blowout on the scoreboard. Lions outscored by seven, allowing five in each contest. Even though the Lions outshot the Buckeyes 73-56, unable to convert scoring chances, unable to convert power plays, just one of seven for 14%. Penalties pretty close as well as face-offs with the edge in both going to the Bucks. But how about this, Penn State in game two? That was their first lead since December 28th in their game against Boston College. But we still come back from another weekend in Penn State, still no closer to a win in conference play. Yeah, the Lions had a great chance to get that first win. They had a big lead up 2 nothing in the second, but they had the mistakes coming down. Godowski addressed that the team is still trying to hit their stride in their mark and get rid of some of the penalties. And that was the topic in this week's sounding off presented by Ace Hardware of State College. In terms of shots, we had we had two goals, obviously, and, and we were playing very well. I, I think I mentioned it before. There's a lot of stages to development, and I think we're on charter territories a little bit. Like, you know, we're ahead 2 nothing, and uh, I don't think we handled it very well. We handled it like a young team, but it's great to have that experience. We're going to be better the next time we get that opportunity. That was Godowski talking about losing that lead to Ohio State, but another big takeaway from game two was the benching of captain Tommy Olchek. Yeah, Coach Godowski didn't elaborate too much on it. He said it was uh, not directed directly at Olchek, but it was more of addressing a team issue in the locker room. It was a message to the team. 
for it was a message to the team, not necessarily just Tommy, a message to the team. And, uh, there was reasons for it. It was something that we as a team try to really build a foundation upon, and uh, and so it was a it was a move. Put it this way, I mean, it was a move uh, directed at the team. He knows exactly what the reasons were, and he was as positive a cheerleader for the guys as you would think. You wonder if that's why Penn State came out with that added intensity and got that two-goal lead early on Ohio State. Always tough, though, playing without your captain, especially in a game you're looking to win on the road. And that is a perfect segue into the good and bad segment. We'll start with the bad. And what did you see bad from Penn State this weekend against Ohio State? Honestly, Mike, there was a lot to pick from because Penn State did not do a lot of things well in this one. You had the slow starts in, in uh, game one to not finishing open chances, but I'm going to go with the penalty kill. On nine opportunities, Ohio State came away with three goals. Saturday, we saw a 2-0 lead evaporate in just under four minutes because of two penalties against the Lions. Shide's penalty was a tough one with that hook happening in the open ice. We said penalties against Ohio State would be key against the seventh best power play unit in the country, and it turned out it was. It's not like this hasn't happened before. We saw it against Union and last week Coach Kodowski even addressed it. Penn State did show some good signs though, especially with some individual plays. What did you see, Mike, from the Lions this week? Well, Penn State really did a great job of battling. They really battled, especially against the boards. When they got the puck against the boards against the Ohio State, the Lion players were working extra hard anytime they were against the glass, really getting extra chances. One that led to a game two goal and really set up a lot of other scoring chances that weren't able to be converted, but that's something we'll get to later. Well, more good for the Lions players this week was David Goodwin. Game one, he had the only goal for the Lions. In game two, he played really nice, creating a lot of chances there. You saw the goal. Watch this chance he creates with the turnover. Feeds Holstrom right in front, but he can't put it on net. He was really crisp with his passing. Watch this. Tape to tape, setting up a lot of good opportunities. And for that, he is our Player of the Week. Next up for the Lions, the only team in the Big Ten the Lions haven't faced yet. The Michigan Wolverines will be coming to Hockey Valley, and we'll preview that matchup when the Blue Line returns. As our program, we, we haven't faced them before. There's always an unknown and an excitement for that. Obviously, they're a top 10 ranked team in the nation again. They have, uh, you know, this is the program that has, has had the most success of any, any program in college history. Welcome back to the Blue Line. Michigan was one of the conference teams that Penn State was unable to face last year, and they will finally get their first chance to face them this year as they face all the other teams in the Big Ten so far. Michigan, the last one to be played against the Lions, and they're in town Friday and Saturday and bringing a lot of history into Hockey Valley. Yeah, they are the premier team in Big Ten hockey. Coach Red Berenson, the fifth all-time winningest coach in Division One hockey, two-time national coach of the year. The Wolverines, they even got the wing helmets on their hockey program, one of the great programs all-time in college hockey. And a lot of history and some impressive statistics that they bring into the game, but Penn State does have the home ice advantage. We'll see how that plays out and we'll see how the teams match up with the Jay Magai Mitsubishi matchup board. Michigan with the 13-6-3 record on the year hasn't been an offensive powerhouse like in years past. Just a little over Penn State in goals per game. All the way down, Michigan better in every category except falling just a fraction worse in face-off win percentage. But obviously, Michigan pulling out their games. And you can credit that's a good goalie play. Michigan has played the tough teams and played them well with that 5-3-1 record. More importantly, the play of Zach Nagelvoort in goal. The freshman allowing just under two goals a game. That's fifth best in the country, their backup, Steve Racine, has been solid too with a 4-1-1 one one mark. The Wolverines tough on D, but Godowski not sleeping on their offense. No, they're very good defensively, but this is Michigan. I mean, they're, they're, and I know some of the players they have, they, they do have a lot of offense, and they're, they're Michigan. They're, they can put the puck in that too. It will be a little different, as you said. We've always come up, I think, I mean, Minnesota was two, Boston College was one, Ohio State was five, I think. So, um, but trust me, Michigan's not, you're not going to notice a lot of, a big dip in offense. So Michigan is good in both areas, offense, defense. They flow well through the neutral zone. But if you're Penn State, you've got to be concerned about your own defense because you've been struggling to score some goals. And, Mike, I know you have the numbers that they can't be, put away their chances. Yeah, and we've talked about it before. Penn State has outshot their opponents so far in five of their last six games. So they're outshooting teams that are the number one and number two offensive teams in the country, but they're not really showing anything for that on the scoreboard, not getting their goals. Yeah, you see it from the tape against Ohio State. Penn State has had the chances. David Goodman with the nice setup, unable to finish. Penn State is getting looks, but here's the stat for you. Penn State is seventh in the nation in shots on goal per game, but all the way down to number 47 in goals per game. 
That's a big drop off there in converting. Penn State has seen this trend and it's have been working on it at practice, getting more action in front of the net and it's a top area of focus for Guy Godowski with his team. We are going to work really hard to get attempts at the net and shots at the net, but then after that you have to work really hard to get traffic there. So um, we've, I, I, that's how we're going to play. Um, but now we have to, we established how to do that. We've been working hard at it all year. I think we've been improving a lot, but now, now you sort of have to add on that to make sure that we're working to get traffic there as well. So it's a bit of a process. Um, when, it, when we all put it together, I think it'll look pretty good, but we're not quite there yet. So no, we face some good goaltending as well, but um, I think we can do a better job creating a lot of traffic. One player that's had luck with the puck is freshman forward Dylan Richard, the Alberta native and birthday boy celebrating the Big 21 on Wednesday. He scored a goal and an assist against Ohio State and is the focus of this week's player profile. I'm here with freshman forward Dylan Richard. And Dylan, you had a big weekend scoring your first multi-point game. What led to your success? Yeah, it wasn't the outcome uh, that we wanted on the weekend, but it was, it was kind of nice to, to get a little uh, success offensively. I think uh, as a line, we really just focused on getting pucks in the net and uh, getting bodies in front. And you've been on the road for a little bit, right in Big Ten play. What's it like coming back and playing in front of the Pagula crowd? Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I don't know if I've played in front of a crowd like it. It's, uh, they're so rowdy. The student section is, is incredible. Um, it's just been a lot of fun so far. And you go by the nickname, the Rocket Richard. What led to that nickname? Yeah, um, I got it when I was around 11 or 12, um, back in minor hockey. Uh, Someone, someone called me the Rocket, just like uh, Maurice Richard, nicknamed the Rocket for Montreal Canadiens back in the day, and I don't know, it just stuck with me. Thanks very much, Dylan. Thank you. Back to you guys. When we come back, we'll check in with the women who had a very special game this past weekend. Don't go anywhere. The Blue Line, we'll be right back. Now pushed back to the point. Marley down into the far circle. A shot on a turnaround and score! Circle, he'll fire one through traffic. Popping free, a shot, score! From the first circle, the Nittany Lions make it 2 nothing. Welcome back to the blue line. You just heard him, Brian Tripp, with the call on the goals out at Ohio State. Brian's back in the studio. Brian, thanks for joining us today. No problem, Andrew. Always enjoy being here. It was a disappointing series out at Ohio State so far this season. Not exactly what the Lions want. What's going on? Well, I think you see a team that is young and still trying to grow, and obviously they've made great strides, but anytime you start making strides, I think you'll have a few steps back as well, and those series just serve as reinforcement for how well you have to play to get the same results. And it has been a different team on the road this season, and I think they're still learning how to play on the road. One of the things that they have to get better at is penalties. We're always talking about it on the show. Coach is always talking about it in the press comments. How are they addressing that issue with the team? One thing that they did early in the season, they brought the Big Ten director of officiating in and they went through game by game and looked at calls that they weren't pleased with and they were wondering what went wrong, what their team was doing wrong, what they need to correct as a team. I think over the course of the season you have seen them improve, however it's certain situations late in a game, 5 minutes and 23 seconds left at Michigan State. You can't take a five-minute major penalty because it puts your team in a tough spot. So Guy Gadowski wants his team to play aggressive. He wants them to play hard. But there are still certain situations where you have to play a little bit smarter, and that's where they need to improve yet. One of the storylines coming out of this weekend was Tommy Olchek being a healthy scratch on Saturday. Coach Gadowski said it was a team issue. They came out, played inspired hockey for the first 20 minutes. Do you think the message was received? I think so. I think any time you have a captain, especially someone with the notoriety that Tommy Olchek has gotten with this team. He really is the face of the program because of just his last name. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with Tommy and then his dad, of course. Uh, I think the message was received well because they came out and played really well and they put themselves into a spot where they hadn't been. Uh, they hadn't led for 20 straight periods and all of a sudden they're out with a 2-0 lead on the road. Now it's about handling that lead and handling it well because we saw obviously that Ohio State went on to score the next five. Some of the guys that we've seen on the rise the past couple weeks have been Eric Schott. It's been the Taylor Holstrom. What do those guys bring to the table that have allowed them to get some scoring going? I think Taylor Holstrom is a very natural scorer. And we saw last year where he started the season a little bit slow, and all of a sudden he starts to hit his stride. And he's starting to get open by crashing the net a little bit more. And Penn State's starting to pick up some dirtier goals where they're throwing the puck to the net, and especially in the first period of the second game at Ohio State, they scored one that way. When you look back to the Boston College game, the goal that tied it at one, where Eric Scheid started poking at it in front of the net. That was another way that they were able to score. I think Eric Scheid and Taylor Holstrom are two of the more gifted scorers, natural scorers on the team. 
But anytime you evolve over the course of the season, I think the continuity that they develop with their teammates has helped. And I think overall, it's just a group that keeps improving and they're starting to find what works for them. Casey Bailey is one of those natural scorers. A few weeks ago on this show, Tim King, your po broadcast partner, actually mentioned him being snake bitten. He got a goal at Ohio State. Do you think that could kind of get him going for the second half of the year? I do. And before that goal at Ohio State, he had a net that had to be 75% open, and he just shot it off the toe of the goaltender and missed another close one. So he was snake bitten once again. And I think you're right. It's probably a goal that it's going to build his confidence, should get him going. And if he gets going, I think if Penn State can get over that hurdle, right now they've had eight games in a row where they've scored two goals or less. They have to get over that hurdle, get to three, get to four, and then you'll probably see them start winning some games. Brian, real quick, quick prediction on this week's Michigan game, the powerhouse coming in. Well, I obviously like Penn State, Andrew, I'll tell you that, but I think it's going to be a really tough series for Penn State. Michigan, obviously, another top 10 team, very good defensively, as I'm sure both you and Mike know, and Michigan has had great goaltending all season long. A very experienced program, a great program with a great history, but I obviously, I'll go with Penn State. Tripper, thanks for being here. And you can catch Brian Tripp and Tim King every game on WRSC 103.1. Mike. Thanks, guys. Women's hockey, big weekend. Penn State tied RIT 2-2 on Friday, but the big one on Saturday. Lions wearing the pink in the skate for the Cure game, benefiting Thon. Everybody was wearing pink. Great atmosphere at Pagula. Even the refs, the pep band was in the house in the pink. Record crowd as well, just under 18. 100 people for the game. Penn State was down 2-1 in the late in the game. RIT's Colby McRae getting it past Nicole Panicia. That made it 3-1. That would be the final as the Lions were unable to get the win on the scoreboard. They looked great and they got a big win for the kids and cancer research. The hockey result we were hoping for today, you know, despite a great effort by both teams, but certainly a great result for two great causes today in Thon and Pink Zone. And I could not be more proud of the Penn State community today in terms of their support for these two great causes. That's always the case with Penn Staters. That's what makes this a special place. It's great to see Coach Josh Brandwin with the pink stripes and here. Everybody really supporting the team there. And this, for the seniors on the team, the season is winding down. Just three more series left in the regular season for the few Lady Lion seniors like Jenna Welch, who now is about the time of the season where they start reminiscing on how special their time at Penn State was, and that's exactly what she did in this week's player profile. We're here with senior Jenna Welch, and Jenna, you guys had a big game on Saturday. Tell the fans a little bit more about that. Yeah, we had our second annual Skate for the Cure game. Um, although it wasn't the results we wanted, uh, I'd say it was a pretty big success because um, we raised over $5,000 for Thon and um, Pink Zone, and so, um, and Besides that, we broke our attendance record as well, so that was pretty cool to see this many people out here um, supporting a great cause. And you're originally from Texas, but you have some family in the Pennsylvania area. What's it like being able to play in front of them? Yeah, I mean, in the past, I really, they really haven't been able to see me play, so um, it's great to get a few family members out for every game and just makes it feel like a home away from home kind of, I guess. Um, yes. And you're getting ready to almost end your career, senior year is winding down. What's it like to be playing your last couple games here? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely bittersweet, and it's been a challenge just leading a group of young people. But, I mean, I just make sure I bring my best every single day and have a positive attitude so I can um, just be a great role model for the younger girls so they can hopefully can do the same for years to come. And so. Thanks very much, Jenna. Back to you guys. Much more still to come on the Blue Line as we highlight a few top plays and check out how the rest of the Big Ten stands. The Blue Line will be right back. The difference is this is so much fun to play in. The passion of the student body, of the people here at, Penn St at State College and our, our Penn State alumni, all the fans here are so much fun to play in. I mean, they really, they really do a great job for us. Welcome back to the Blue Line. Penn State ready to get home after they struggled on the road against Ohio State to get into the scoring column, but they were able to make some big plays against the Buckeyes, especially from Matt Scoff in Game 2 against the Buckeyes' leading scorer. Yeah, and for that, it's our Aaron's amazing save of the week. Game 2, you guessed it, on Ryan Dezingle. Senators draft pick all alone. Couple of deeks. Tries to go forehand, but Scoff are up to the task with a nice poke check. Take another look, forehand, backhand, back to the forehand, and Scoffer gets it. Really big save at that point for Penn State. Probably should have won with a triple deep like Gordon Bombay. And our Cove Crunch of the Week goes to Ohio State's Justin De Silva. Great hit on Taylor Holstrom to end a Penn State rush. Really takes him out. More like a linebacker hit on that one. It is Big Ten overall, so Urban Meyer should keep 
his eyes out on him and take a trip down the hall maybe to have him on his roster for spring practice. Looking at the scoreboard from last week, it was all Big Ten, and a lot of the games had implications in the standings. Yeah, let's take a look at the scoreboard. Michigan State stands out, out beating Minnesota again in a shootout. Spartans with Minnesota's number this year. The Gophers did fight back with a shutout in the next game. Michigan avenged their early season losses to Wisconsin, sweeping the Badgers at Yost. Game one, three, one, and then the second in a shootout. Brings us to the Big Ten standings. Michigan moving up to jump past Wisconsin with the weekend sweep. Ohio State with the two wins inch closer to 500 in conference. Michigan State continuing to get points with shootout wins, and Minnesota and Penn State remain the bookends. Coming up, more conference goodness this week. Top ranked Minnesota faces Wisconsin. Tough road test for the Gophers. Ohio State tried to take their win streak on the road in East Lansing against the Spartans, and Michigan coming into Hockey Valley. Long needing a win. And before the game, Penn State will be getting mentally prepared in their locker room, getting the focus ready for the Wolverines. And we were lucky enough to take a sneak peek inside the women's locker room to see what the facilities are like at Penn State in our Pagula Spotlight. Entering Penn State's locker room, visitors are treated to a wide open space. Both the men and women are set up the same way, the women getting a little more length. It's the same. This room's a little bit bigger. Same width, same lockers, you know, same stalls. What's unique is the ventilation. These locker rooms are designed to not smell like a typical hockey locker room. Skates are up here. Not bad. What goes underneath? Uh, mainly just, it's just a travel bag. Uh, um, some of them keep a few extra things in there, but it's just, it's supposed to be pretty empty to help with the airflow. Drying it out helps prevent the smell. In Penn State fashion, an ice replica logo sits right in the middle. Oh yeah, somebody walked right on it. Like one guy came in and stepped on it. I go 10 push-ups and he got right down. The women's room was kept orderly and neat, waiting for the teams to arrive, and right outside the team has a place to relax and even have a little fun, making Hockey Valley, hashtag Ping Pong Valley. And the Nittany Health South injury update, just one name to mention, David Glenn, still day-to-day -day recovering from his bone marrow donation. Penn State has been lucky with the injury bug up to this point in the season. That's been not a good result for the Mo. Haven't been able to convert that into wins. What does Penn State need to do to convert this weekend into a win against Michigan? Well, they got to come out with some intensity. You can't let the weekend series keep you down, and you got to gotta limit penalties. I, we sound like broken record every single week, but that's actually the key. All right, so Penn State, Michigan, Friday night and Saturday night. Penn State women also home this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. That'll do it for the Blue Line. Andrew Callista, Mike Trusta, we'll see you next week. <laughs>